Okay, so let's start with um, the first lecture um, in which we're gonna cover the prerequisites. Um, so this lecture was made by Emilio and me and Alejandro. Um, so yeah, it's uh, the mathematics and classical computing prerequisites that we're gonna need to complete some things and make some calculations for quantum computing. So as Adam showed you, um, well, this is the course overview. So this is the first part in which uh, we're gonna talk about the prerequisites. Fine, right, so uh, the goals of this lecture are to get you comfortable with the basic tools of mathematics commonly used in quantum computing and get you comfortable with Dirac's notation used in quantum mechanics and therefore in quantum computing. So yeah, it's a notation that we're gonna need to simplify some calculations, but it's a more general notation, not only used in quantum computing, but well, it comes from um, quantum mechanics. And look at the inner works of classical computers so we can compare them to those of uh, quantum computers later. So this is just gonna be a, at the end um, a short introduction to quantum, uh, sorry, classical computing. So in the next lectures, uh, you're gonna see like um, the difference. Uh, uh, you will be able to compare uh, what the classical computers uh, make and well, the quantum. So uh, the contents of this lecture um, are gonna be uh, complex numbers and some basic operations uh, with them. Then we're gonna talk about linear algebra, vector spaces, operators, eigenvalues, and eigenvectors. And finally, uh, classical computing, so about gates and universality. Okay, so we can start now with the complex numbers. So um, a complex number um, is made of two parts. The first one is uh, a real part, and the other one is the imaginary part. Um, so the imaginary unit is defined in this way. So you can check that no real number satisfies this condition. So, well, we, ha we have these two parts. The first one is the real part. Um, here we have an axis that's called the real or the real axis. So if you have a real number, you can place it in a, in a line, in a real line. The same happens if you have an imaginary number, it's only in one dimension. But if you combine these two numbers, one number made of a real part and an imaginary part, you get a complex number. So these numbers um, have, have to be placed in, in, the, in the plane, in the complex plane. So this is how we build the complex plane, just a real axis and an imaginary axis. And any point in that plane is a complex number. So in this case, this is uh, well, this is our number, a plus bi. So the real component, which is the projection of the real axis, and same with the imaginary one. So this is um, this way of representing it. Like uh, the first one is the Cartesian way of representing a complex number. But we can also represent it um, in other ways, such as uh, the polar way of representing a, a number. For the polar way, we need the magnitude or the length of the number and the angle that it forms with respect to the, the real axis. So we can use um, some simple trigonometric um, relations. So this is P and this equals um, R sine of a, and this is A, or this equals R the sine of B. So we can take advantage of these trigonometric um, relations to rewrite our complex number. So, uh, well, the magnitude or the radius, uh, we can call it both ways, is just, um, well, the length, which is uh, given by Pythagoras theorem. You just have to, to square the, or yeah, the sides and take the square root. So this allows us to write this complex number. Well, this is um, 
this is uh, A, for the internet in the graph. And this is just B. So we can write our number as the magnitude of the number times the cosine of B plus I sine B. And there is an identity in all well, complex numbers, which is called the Euler's identity. That states that this quantity equals E to the I pi. So we can write our <clears throat> complex number in these two ways. <clears throat> and those are totally equivalent. Fine, so uh, we have numbers, so we can make some operations some simple operations uh, between them. One of them is the, well, the addition. We, we have two complex number. Uh, the first one is Z equals A plus B I. Uh, let's say the second one is C plus D I. So yeah, we have those two numbers. We can add them, we can subtract them, and we can multiply them. Uh, the addition is um, quite uh, simple. We have to write the numbers again, C plus D I. And this is gonna give us what well, we can associate the real part and the imaginary part. So we get a new complex number uh, whose real um, part is the addition of the real parts of the initial numbers. And the same with the imaginary um, component. Uh, we can also subtract them. It's um, actually the same, but we only have to change the sign of the second number. I use D, I, yeah. And we can multiply them. We make uh, C times uh, W. We can replace the numbers. Uh, well, just have to distribute those operations. Um, A times C plus uh, B, C, I plus A, D, I plus uh, B, D, I squared. But I squared is by definition uh, minus one, because that's well, the definition of the unit, um, of the imaginary unit. So this is uh, going to give us this part is going to be uh, minus B, D. So we can rearrange those terms to get the following. Plus B C A D I. So if we multiply uh, two complex numbers, uh, we get a new complex number um, whose components are given by this, the real part and the imaginary part. So well, it's uh, different um, from the real multiplication, but well, it can still be done. And we have a new operation with complex numbers, which is called the complex conjugation. Um, so yeah, it's an, um, a new operation. And all it does is to turn i, the unit, the imaginary unit, into minus i. It's gonna um, like rotate the complex number or flip the imaginary part of the complex number. So let's say, uh, well, we have the complex plane, real axis, imaginary axis. We have our usual number uh, z equals a plus bi. So the imaginary part is b. And when we conjugate the number, we have to flip the imaginary part. So we're going to turn b into minus b. Well, it's because we're uh, changing the imaginary uh, sign. So we get the complex uh, conjugate which we denote by uh, C, uh, C star, uh, which is given by A, the real part is untouched, and the imaginary part is flipped as I, as I told you. So it can be yeah, like uh, this uh, rotation of the, of the complex number. So yeah, um, it can be summarized in this, this item, this item. Uh, if we have a complex number, C equals A plus B I, it's complex conjugate, it's gonna be, Sorry. Okay. So uh, the complex uh, conjugate is going to be uh, the conjugate equals a minus pi. 
Now, what happens if we multiply a complex number by its conjugate? So uh, let's make this multiplication c times c conjugate. A plus b i times a minus b i. So again, we have to distribute um, the terms of the sum. So a squared minus a b i plus a b i minus b squared times i squared. So these um, two terms cancel and we get a squared minus b squared i squared, but i squared equals minus one. So we get a plus sign. So this is um, really interesting and useful because we can use the conjugate to compute the magnitude because um, this is a Pythagoras uh, theorem. This is just the magnitude of the complex number squared, or in terms of the radius, it's the radius squared. So yeah, that's why the conjugate is useful because it allows us to compute the magnitude of the complex number. And the magnitudes are gonna be um, the most important quantities in the sense of our quantum mechanics. Um, now we can multiply to, to conjugates. So for example, the C number conjugate times W conjugate. So we said this W equals uh, C plus D I. So well, let's replace them. A minus D I times C minus D I. And well, again, distributing. AC minus ABI minus BCI plus BDI squared. And this is AC minus BD minus AD plus BCI. So um, let's see the Usual multiplication of two complex numbers, uh, which we computed above. No. Fine, so uh, the multiplication was um, defined in this way. This is the real component, uh, which remains the same if we conjugate, but the imaginary part is flipped in the case of uh, the conjugation. So um, in short, we can say that um, the product of the conjugates equal, equals the conjugate of the product. So this is one of the properties of the, the conjugate, the conjugates, yeah. And we can again uh, define the simple operations with conjugates. Uh, these ones are for well, the, the addition of the conjugates. So see conjugate plus W conjugate, this is A minus BI plus C minus BI. So this is giving us the conjugate of the, of the addition um, because this is A plus C minus B plus BI. So yeah, then the sum of the conjugates is the conjugate of the, of the sum. Now um, the conjugate of the conjugate, um, Recall that the conjugate makes this operation, turns i into minus i. But if we conjugate again, we get a minus minus i, so it remains the same. So the conjugate of the conjugate of a complex number gives the same initial number. Fine. Um, now the, the magnitude of the, of the complex number as as I showed you above in the previous slide. It can be computed in terms of the, of the conjugate, the, the magnitude, um, because we had this relation. This was the magnitude squared. So if we want to compute the, the magnitude, uh, we just have to, to take the square root.
So yeah, that's one of the very important things of the, the conjugates. Now we can start uh, talking about linear algebra. Oh, but um, before I start, do you have any, any question? Um, guys, just to reiterate, if you have any question, uh, please post them in Q and A in Discord. Uh, yeah, that'll be all. Good. So yeah, now let's just start with linear algebra. Um, since quantum states can be represented as vectors, we need to get into the linear algebra. So um, in the next slides, um, we're going to talk about uh, some quantum states and well, linear algebra is, is a tool that we need to compute and yeah, make calculations of quantum states. So that's why it's important to start and give some concepts of linear algebra. And it allows us to study vectors, how they interact with each other, how they're transformed about matrices. And um, well, this field is much broader than this, but we only need some basic concepts to get started. So let's see what those concepts are. So um, one of them are, um, is the vectors. So a vector is just an, well, an, an array of numbers. So you have a, a set of say n numbers and you want to organize them, you want, yeah, to put them in an array. So you, you define a, a vector and you have two possible ways of defining this, this array. Um, one of them is the column vector. But the other one, the other option uh, we have is the row vector. So yeah, um, this is uh, the vector A, uh, whose components are the numbers that we organized. And the other option is called, uh, well, it has a, it has a T, so it has a, a T here, and it's called the transpose. Uh, we're gonna see that operation later, but well, it just um, the transpose turns the column into the row or the row into the column. So, yeah, the transpose, the transpose transforms the columns of a vector or even a matrix into rows. Fine. Um, so, the dimension of a vector is its number of entries. So, if we have n entries from one or to n. We say that the dimension of that vector, the same here, one to n, dimension equals n. So it's the number of or the number of entries uh, we have. So to see some simple examples, let's take uh, a vector whose entries are real. So let's take uh, only in this slide. Let's work with real only real numbers. So if the dimension is one, we have only one number. So it can be represented in, in the real line. And yeah, let's, let's see, dimension one is only uh, a scalar. If we have two dimensions, well, we have two components, so we have numbers, and we can organize that vector in the plane. Just like a, a complex number, a complex number has two components, so a vector of dimension two as two components, so we can um, we can write it and represent it in the in the plane. And if n equals three, we can um, we can write we can draw our vector in the space. So we have we have the three axes x y z. And well, if n equals four, five, and so on, well, we cannot uh, draw it. But yeah, it's like the dimension is increasing. So uh, yeah, that's my, uh, the notion of vectors. We can also define some simple operations with vectors. One of them is the vector addition or scalar multiplication. So um, let's say we have uh, two vectors. The first one is A, we have the N components here, and let's say B, the second vector, B, 
Pn. So um, the addition of those two vectors is going to be the addition of the components. Am plus Pn. So yeah, that's how we we add two vectors. We just have to add the components. Um, it only works for the uh, row representation of the vectors. So it will be like this, A1 plus B1 up to AN plus BN. So this is the other way to represent the, the vector. Um, we have also the scalar multiplication. So we have to choose the scalars, which are just the numbers. Um, they can be real, they can be complex. So let's say that number is K. So if we um, multiply that number K by vector A, we get the following. K times A1, well, at least up to the nth component. So if we have the scalar multiplication, we have to multiply um, each component of the, the vector by, by the scalar. So this is just gonna uh, resize our vector or well, transform, multiply it. Um, also, we have the conjugate transpose. So we have these two words, the conjugate, which, which we mentioned uh, above, and transpose, which we also uh, mentioned. Well, this is from complex number numbers, and this is from arrays, for example, where this is, um, it can be applied to, to vectors. So uh, we have A, which is, let's write it again, AN. And if we make the conjugate transpose, we have to conjugate and transpose. So this is, um, this is written as this. This is the dagger. Something shaped like this. Oh, well, you can just write that. Um, this is the dagger. So um, a dagger is the conjugate uh, transpose, so we get a row vector, but the components are conjugate. So yeah, we have these um, two words, so we have to make like two operations, conjugate and transpose. Um, Fine. Um, so the magnitude of, of the vector is just uh, like in complex numbers, the length of the vector. So we can use Pythagoras theorem. Well, if we have two dimensions, it's just uh, well, the sum, the squared sum of the, the sides. But if we go um, to higher dimensions, um, the Pythagoras theorem is generalized. So um, the magnitude of a vector A. You write it like with two lines, or if you want, you keep it this way. Um, so you have to take the square root of the well, the first component, uh, the magnitude squared, up to the nth component, and this is it. This is just the Pythagoras theorem. Uh, in n dimensions, in n dimensions, and this can also be written as um, the a, well, the a conjugate and transpose, um, which is uh, I'm gonna write it in this in this way. So yeah, um, if we make this operation, we're gonna get, um, well, we have to square root. Um, if we make this multiplication, we're gonna get the same, the same sum. Um, so um, we're gonna see that later again, I don't remember which is like, but well, it's below. Um, fine, so let's get in. Uh, vector spaces uh, and new concept in this in this line. 
So a vector space is a collection of vectors, a field of scalars and two operations, uh, vector addition and scalar multiplication. Multiplication, yeah. Um, so yeah, we have, this is the first part, a collection of vectors. So we have like, um, say, U1, uh, U2, we have, yeah, like a collection of vectors, we have many. Um, yeah, the other part is a field of scalars. So we need to, we need a set from which uh, we choose, from which we take the scalar, scalars, from which we take the numbers. So this is the field of scalars. It can be, for example, the real numbers or the complex numbers. And we need two operations, the vector addition, which uh, we mentioned uh, above, and the scalar multiplication. Um, and it's important uh, to mention that the linearity is going to be given in terms of the vector, well, the addition and the scalar multiplication. Those are the most important concepts on linearity. The definition comes from those operations. Fine, so uh, what happens if we choose uh, the scalars from the real numbers, then we get a, a real vector space. And if we choose those numbers from the complex, um, from the complex numbers, the complex uh, set of numbers, uh, we get complex vector space. So um, in quantum computing, we'll be working with uh, complex vector spaces. So our scalars are going to be complex numbers, with no, no exception. Uh, okay. So um, we can define like what does a vector space uh, satisfy? So we have uh, the two operations. One is the vector addition. So this slide is from, uh, from the vector addition. So um, if V is a vector space, then the following are true. So let's take two elements from that, uh, from that set V. And if it's a vector space, then the following uh, items are true. So U plus V is in V. So it's um, something like this. If this is the set V, and we have here the vector U, we have somewhere the vector V. And within in that space V, we're also going to find uh, the addition close to V. So it's going to be in the set. It's not going to be um, like outside of the set. So this is one of the properties. Uh, the, the other one is the, that the sum is commutative. So we can, we can add U and V or V and U. It's going to give you the same result. Uh, the other one is that you can um, associate. So we can make the parentheses. We can make the operations in the order you want. So yeah, we have uh, three vectors. Uh, w is also in V. We have three vectors in here in the set. And we want to add uh, those three vectors. So we can choose which pairs um, to sum first and then uh, sum the other one. Um, also, there exists a, a zero vector in V. So somewhere here is the zero. Well, I'm running out of space. It's not. Um, yeah, uh, there's the zero vector in B, which satisfies this condition. So it behaves like the zero number, but it's not a number, it's a vector. So U plus uh, the zero vector gives you the same U vector. Now, for every U in the, in the set, uh, there, there exists a, a vector which we call minus U, such that um, u minus u equals the zero vector. So this is the existence of the inverse with respect to the, to the addition. Fine. Um, so we saw the properties of a vector space um, with respect to the vector addition. Now let's see the properties with respect to the scalar multiplication. So imagine we have um, that set V again. 
do it. And this time we have to choose the scalars because we're gonna treat the uh, scalar multiplication. So we choose them from the field uh, C, that's in general a uh, complex field. Um, fine, so let's set again, um, let's take again two vectors, U and B, and two scalars uh, C and D, which are in C. And if V is a vector space, then the following properties are uh, satisfied or true. The first one is that in the set, you're gonna also find C, C times U. So you're gonna find it somewhere here. So it's gonna be in the set uh, as well. Um, this is the um, distributed law with, with respect to the vector addition. So we add the vectors and we can distribute the scalar. So yeah, uh, C times U and then C times V. Uh, we can also make a parenthesis as well as in the uh, vector addition. Um, well, if you multiply first by D and then by C, it's gonna give you the same result if you multiply first by C and then by D. Um, fine, um, this one is the distributive law with respect to the um, addition of, of scalars, some scalar addition. So we can, uh, you can distribute in this case the, the vector u in order to get uh, c times u and c times u. And finally, if you multiply by well, the number one, uh, you get the same the same vector because uh, remember, remember that when you multiply a vector by a scalar, uh, each component must be multiplied by that scalar. So if you multiply by one, you're gonna get the same components therefore the same vector. Now we can um, we can define a new a new operation. Uh, so far we have the vector spaces which only requires two operations um, the vector addition and the multiplication by uh, scalar. So if we define a new operation um, we call it the inner product or the dot product, which is the usual name in Euclidean uh, geometry. Um, yeah, if we define a new operation, it's not going to be like the vector space because it has an additional uh, operation. So we start from vector spaces and then we get to the Hilbert space. So a Hilbert space is like take that vector space and define the inner product. The inner product is going to be an operation between uh, or between the elements of the of the set. So um, the dot product of two vectors in in C n, the C n stands for, for we have the complex number uh, vectors uh, with real and with complex entries, complex components, and n is the dimension. So we take a, a vector u, u1 up to un, and those components are all complex. So this or all, these are all complex. So um, the dot product is defined as follows. Um, u, or dot, so let's say times v, is the sum, um, of, uh, it covers all the components of the vectors uh, from i equals one to, to n. And we multiply the components. So it's the addition of the, yeah, the addition of the multiplication of the components, but the first component must be uh, the conjugate component. So yeah, that's it. If we write it in the longer version of that, um, this, U1 conjugate U1 plus that up to N. Yeah. So that's uh, the dot product. It has a geometrical interpretation, which we're gonna uh, treat in the next in the next slide. 
But um, an important um, property of this dot product is that we can write magnitudes in terms of that inner product or that dot product. Um, and remember, remember what I said that magnitudes are really important. So if we have the magnitudes, if we have ways to compute magnitudes, then we're we're okay, we're we're good. We're going in the right direction. So yeah, we can uh, compute the magnitude of that vector u. So remember that um, the magnitude was the sum of the, the components. So this, this part is uh, u1 squared plus uh, and the magnitude squared. And the square root of that is just uh, Pythagoras theorem, the generalized way. So we can write it in terms of the dot product because um, this is just the dot product of the vector u with itself. So yeah, that's um, a good um, consequence of the, the dot product, the calculation of magnitudes. Now let's get into the um, geometrical interpretation of that, that product. So we have um, we have these vectors of dimension n. So let's let's imagine we can draw them u and n. So those are in n dimensions, and the dot product this is going to be computed uh, using magnitude of u, just the uh, length of u, the length of v. So we need the magnitudes, and we also need the cosine of the angle between them. So those are vectors pointing in, in general in different directions. So there's an angle between them, and we need to take the cosine of that angle. So the geometrical interpretation of that is a projection. So let's say uh, we have like this. So this is gonna be this gonna be the dot product. So that's the interpretation. Um, the projection of a vector in the other one is the, well, the geometrical interpretation of the dot product. Um, if we are working with unit vectors, um, because we're going to work with them, with them, this is just um, a definition. A unit vector is a vector whose magnitude equals one. So, yeah, this, this is the definition. Fine. Um, uh, so, if two vectors are orthogonal, then the angle between them is pi over two pi half, so 90 degrees. So this is u, let's say, this is v, and the angle between them is it's pi halves. Then we say they are orthogonal. So if they are orthogonal, it means there is no projection of the vector v on, on u because Okay, they are orthogonal, they form a 90 degrees angle. So we have a new definition of orthogonality, not only saying that the angle between them is pi halves, but saying that the dot product uh, of them equals zero. Yeah. And this uh, dot product allows us to define orthonormal basis. So this orthonormal basis has two, two words in, in one. The ortho comes from um, the orthogonal. The normal uh, means that unit vectors. So basically um, this orthonormal basis is a set of vectors which are orthogonal. Um, every vector is orthogonal to, to the rest in that set, and also the magnitude of those vectors, each vector is one. So it's gonna 
a form of orthonormal basis. But well, this word basis uh, implies something else that we're going to be discussing. Uh, so vectors can be represented as a sum of other vectors, that is uh, a linear combination. So if we have an arbitrary vector and we can like decompose it into a sum of other vectors, and those other vectors are satisfying these properties of orthogonality and unit uh, magnitude, then we say we have a, a basis. Mm -hmm. So a basis is a set that is um, that it's enough to represent any vector in the space. So um, particularly, we are interested in representing a vector as a sum of linearly independent vectors. So the vectors in that basis are going to be independent between them. You cannot represent one of them in terms of the rest. And those vectors are of unit magnitude and orthogonal to each other. So this is um, like uh, the definition of the orthonormal basis. So again, um, if we have we, call, um, we have this set V, so we take a vector a random or an arbitrary vector U, and we have here some bases. So we can represent this vector in terms of the vectors that are here. Let's say uh, V1. So yeah. Those vectors are enough to represent any uh, vector in, in the whole um, space B. So let's take some um, simple examples. Uh, for example, this um, vector two components, A, B. Uh, here, A, B are in general complex numbers. So we can um, decompose that vector into the sum of other vectors. So this is A times the vector one zero uh, plus b uh, times the vector zero one. So this is a linear combination uh, because we have some scalars and we have some vectors. So um, this set of these two vectors um, if we compute the magnitude uh, let's say this is um, well, uh, V1, and this is V2. If we compute the magnitude of those vectors, it's only one because it only has one non-zero component and that non-zero component equals one. So the magnitude equals one. And, and also the dot product of these two vectors equals zero. So this is, an orthonormal basis. And we can represent a vector of two components in terms of this orthonormal basis of this uh, set of vectors. Um, we can uh, work um, an example in three dimensions, but it's, it's actually the same thing. So uh, if we have three components, we will have uh, three vectors. Um, so we have this set, one, zero, 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 zero. So yeah, um, these vectors are of unit magnitude and you can compute the dot product of them. And it's gonna be a zero. So they're orthogonal and unit magnitudes and therefore it's an orthonormal set. and it can, it, that set is enough to represent a vector of three components. So, well, that's an orthonormal basis. Uh, okay. So this is just um, like the definition of, of uh, linear combination that I mentioned above. So given a set of vectors UI, we can write any vector as a linear combination of them. So um, we need, we take a, an arbitrary vector of the set uh, B. 
in this case it's called a and we need some scalars um, in this case they're alpha so alpha one times the first vector of the basis so the basis is somewhere here we have u vectors one yeah say up to the end so we need uh, the n scalars and we write it uh, this way so let's uh, make uh, an example on, on this uh, linear combination for example um consider the following set one over the square root of two um one 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 over the square root of two one minus one so this is uh the first vector uh u1 this is uh, u2 so we can check that um the magnitude of those vectors equals one because well um it's the sum of the components squared so the first component squared is one half and it's the same for for those two vectors and one half so we get one so yeah the magnitude of those vectors um is, is one and also the dot product of them equals we have to multiply the components and and add them so the first components is um, well, the product is one half minus one half so we get zero so this is an orthonormal basis for um, those uh, vectors with two two components so let's um take the vector one zero and represent this vector one zero as a linear combination of these basis vectors. So we have uh, alpha one times u one plus alpha two times u. So this is uh, alpha one over the square root of two one one um, plus alpha two over the square root of two one minus one. So um, if we add the components, we get uh, one over the square root of two. Here's alpha one plus alpha two, alpha one minus alpha two. Then um, we need this vector to be uh, equal to, to this, to this one. So um, we can check that alpha one equals um, alpha two equals the square root of two over two. Um, because if we replace these values in here, um, we get one over the square root of two. Here is uh, square root of two over two plus square root of two over two. And here is uh, just zero because those are equal. And well, the square root of two cancel and we get one half plus one half and we get one zero. So uh, what's important here is that we can represent this vector, which was arbitrary, an arbitrary vector of the set in terms of some basis vectors. And that's the linear combination. Um, fine, and do you have any, any question? I think all are taken care of in the chat. Um, because um, there's nothing in the pasting uh, channel, so well, so well, I'm, I'm going to continue. Yeah, because we, we we take it care of it uh, in the chat. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's um start with Rex notation. So this is a notation that comes from quantum mechanics in general, and therefore it's used in quantum computing. And you're gonna see that this, this notation is going to simplify um, working 
with the, with the concepts we presented above much easier. So that's the importance of this notation. And it consists of bras and kids. So the bra is written in this way, just an uh, angle uh, bracket, and the cat is this. And in fact, there's nothing new but this notation. I mean, we're going to be working with the same vectors, but using some different symbols and different uh, notation. But in fact, it's not uh, so new, like the, what's, what's behind this notation. So um, first, let's start with the with the cat. This is the cat. This is the bra. So the cat is defined as just the column vector. So we have the n, n components. Um, and yeah, that's the definition of, of the cat. And therefore, uh, as well as when we were working with the vectors, we said that, well, we can make a vector as a column or as a row. So here we have also the two options. We have the cat and the bra because we have the column vector and the uh, row vector. So uh, the bra is defined as the complex conjugate of the cat. So we need to, um, to transform the column into the row up here and conjugate the components. So that's the, the bra. Uh, okay, so uh, we can write the inner product in terms of, of the bra and the cat. Because um, recall the inner product could be written uh, this way. So this is just a, a bra, a U, and this is the cat. Okay, uh, here there are, um, is the other other way, but it's, it's the same. Um, so yeah, if we have uh, say V, which is a row vector uh, times a column vector, we get the dot product. So we're gonna kind of merge uh, these lines uh, in order to get a bracket. This is a bracket. Bracket. And this bracket represents the dot product of, of the two, two vectors. And of course, it's going to be the same as, as the dot product, this addition of the multiplication of the components in which the, the first component is conjugated. So yeah, this is uh, the new notation we have. Now, um, we can define some, like with a very short introduction to qubits or quantum states. So we have qubits as quantum states. So um, I'm not uh, I'm not going to get much into the physical definition of a qubit, but more on the representation uh, of a qubit in terms of the linear algebra and the tools we have we have seen. Um, so we can represent a quantum state as a cat P C equals alpha uh, times uh, a zero cat plus beta times one cat. So um, these these numbers, um, as I mentioned before, are complex numbers. So in quantum mechanics, we have uh, those complex uh, vector spaces. So well, yeah, those, those scalars are complex. And these uh, cat zero and one are two distinguishable quantum states. We, um, those, those states have some physical interpretation, but meanwhile, it's just a, a distinguishable quantum states. If you can distinguish between two states, between two vectors, it means that those vectors are independent. And in particular, uh, those are independent and orthogonal. So the zero state is this vector one, zero, and the one state is zero, one. So they're distinguishable because, well, they're orthogonal, but also notice that they are a unit of unit magnitude. 
Fine. Um, so we can take again our, our quantum state and replace this uh, zero and one state with uh, vectors. Therefore, we can write uh, our state of psi as alpha times, well, this is zero plus beta times one. So we have this uh, two vector of two components, which is a uh, well, real, uh, sorry, complex entries, components uh, with complex entries. And this is uh, a qubit. It's actually uh, a qubit. There's um, an additional relation that, uh, that is below this, this slide. But um, yeah, we can work with that. Uh, a qubit is a quantum state, and a quantum state is represented as, as this ket, which is a linear combination of two distinguishable states, so a linear combination. Um, it's important to, to notice that a quantum state can be a linear combination of two distinguishable states. Because uh, that's called a uh, superposition. Superposition, you're gonna see that uh, in the next lectures, but that's an important uh, concept. Um, and it's based on linearity because say we have a set, uh, let's not call it V, but uh, the set of quantum states. So we have here the state zero, the state one, which are distinguishable. Or well, this is, uh, let's say this is V, the, state, the set of quantum states. So we saw that the addition of two vectors is also in the set. So a linear combination of this, of this way, of these two, two vectors, is also a quantum state. And that's, uh, that has uh, some important implic implications that a superposition or a linear combination is also a quantum state. Fine. Um, so as we saw, a qubit is represented as, as a quantum state, which is a linear combination of two distinguishable uh, quantum states, or the basis. Mm. And those alpha and beta, which are complex number numbers, are called the probability amplitudes. And well, that 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 makes um, this state to have um, a probability interpretation. Um, because what we mean by amplitudes, by probability amplitudes, is that alpha, if we take the magnitude of alpha and square it then we get the probability of finding the qubit in the state zero. And the same for beta squared, which is the probability of finding the, the qubit, finding quantum state in the state one. So um, this is uh, like the, the notion of the probability amplitudes. So uh, that's, what, that's why I told you that a uh, quantum state has um, a more as a, um, a new relation that must be satisfied, which is um, the probability interpretation. Because if we interpret these quantities as amplitude, uh, as probability amplitudes, then the sum of probabilities equals one. So if this is the probability of finding the state in zero, and this is the probability of finding the state in one, then the addition of them equals one. So just like um, we have this quantum state, or this, um, in this case, it's a, a qubit. And it's in a linear combination of the states. But if we want to know in which state and, um, the qubit is, so let's call the measurement, uh, we start talking about probabilities. So that's why we need that inter the probability interpretation. And if this condition is satisfied, then we approve it to be a, a quantum state or a state vector. So a state vector must uh, satisfy the probability addition, which I will say add, add to one. <clears throat> so um, in other words, uh, the state vector is of unit magnitude. 
So we are talking about uh, the same thing, but from different perspectives. Uh, one of them is the probability, and the other one is the magnitude of the state or the magnitude of this vector, which equals one. <coughs> Okay. Uh, so uh, what happens if I have a quantum state? Does not um, satisfy that uh, normality, um, yeah, which is not normalized, um, which means that uh, this sum is not one. So we need to normalize our, our state. So if we take, uh, we saw previously, we saw an example with, the vector one, but let's predict this this vector. So let's say we have uh, this vector, and if we compute the uh, this, well, this this can be um, decomposed as one times one zero plus i times zero one. So this um, alpha equals one and beta equals i. So if we compute this quantity, this sum, we have uh, the magnitude of alpha squared is one and the magnitude of uh, beta, the magnitude of beta equals one because, well, this is i conjugate times i, which is, well, <clears throat> minus one times i squared, which gives us one. So, oh, sorry, this is, this is, not, this is not one. Uh, okay, so uh, this is one plus one, which gives us two. Um, so this state is not normalized. So it, it's not an, an state vector. It's not a, a qubit. We need to normalize it. Now, how, how do we uh, normalize it? We just have to divide by the magnitude of, of the state. So uh, recall the magnitude is, well, in this case, we have two components. So the magnitude of, of, um, of the state of uh, psi equals the square root of alpha squared plus theta squared. So we have to divide our state. So we get a C hat which is our normalized uh, state. So it's uh, psi over the magnitude of the, the state. And that's how we normalize our, our state. So in this case, we have uh, psi over the square root of two, which is this quantity. So our normalized vector will look uh, like this. Yeah. Now you can check that uh, this condition is satisfied. So this is a, this is a state vector. Now um, we have seen uh, single qubits, but most of the times we'll be working with more than one qubit. So suppose, uh, we, suppose uh, you have two qubits. The first one is the usual that we've been working with. Uh, alpha zero plus beta one. And let's say we have a new qubit, uh, which we call phi equals delta zero plus gamma one. So the combined state is going to be written uh, in this way. This is uh, the tensor product. It's the name of that operation, which is just a, a product of vectors or a product of states. But well, it has a has a formal way of operating it with vectors. But in this case, let's just leave it as as a product, and let's see what what we get. So the combined state is well, it's uh, this one. So let's uh, rewrite our states. This is uh, psi as beta one uh, times delta zero plus gamma one. Oh, um, we need the tensor product here. 
Okay, so we can uh, distribute the, the parts of, of, the, of the state. So we get alpha, delta, here zero, zero, plus alpha, gamma, zero, one, plus beta, delta, one, zero, plus uh, beta, gamma, one, one. Okay, so we can simplify this using a, a convention. So we have those pro those tensor products. Um, so it's gonna be easier to write this as zero, zero, plus alpha, gamma, zero, one. So we're merging, we're bringing those states together in a single, um, in a single ket, um, beta, delta, this is one zero plus beta gamma one one. So um, I want you to look at this. I want you to notice this. Um, this is a, a zero. This is a one. This is a two. This is a three. So we have two qubits, uh, two qubits and um, four, um, Four states, or four distinguishable states. Uh, well, you can count them. There are four. Um, well, if we have one qubit, we have two possible states. If we have three qubits, then we will have eight states. And in general, if we get to n qubits, we need um, we'll have two to the n states. So that's why uh, the dimension of, of the vector representing n qubits is of dimension two to the n. And so um, this, these vectors have four components because the dimension of uh, the space of the vectors of, of two qubits is four. Fine. Um, so, um, we can say it with different words, but it's going to be totally equivalent. So a state, a state vector in a Hilbert space H of dimension two to the N describes an N qubit system. This is um, the same, these are the same, um, the same thing, but with different words. Uh, a state vector, which is well, just a vector that satisfies the normalized condition. In a Hilbert space, the Hilbert space is the vector space of quantum states in which we define the inner product. Uh, and it has dimension two to the n because we need two to the n entries to describe n qubits. So that's it. Now we can get to the operators. So we have yeah, we have the qubits, but how do we transform them? How can we make operations with them? How do we manipulate them? So here comes the concept of operators. Um, so as well as in, in, in the states, we, we can represent a state using the Dirac's notation and using just a single vector. And here we can represent uh, the transformations or gates as operators um, or matrices. So um, let's say we have a qubit V, we have a state V, and we want to transform it. And that transformation is gonna be called A, say it's A. So A is gonna be applied on V, and we're gonna get a new state uh, W, or a new vector. Um, these operators uh, must satisfy some conditions in, in quantum computing, which we're gonna uh, see right now. So um, operators in quantum computing need to be linear and unitary to preserve probability. We have uh, two words here, uh, the linearity. And I mentioned here that linearity is given in terms of the vector addition and the multiplication by scalar. So yeah, this um, 
two properties means a mean linearity. <coughs> Fine, uh, so linearity means that if we have a, a vector uh, addition, then uh, we apply A. It's the same of applying A to the first state and then adding the action of A over the second, or the second vector, second state. That's the first uh, property that implies linearity. And the second one is the, the same, but with multiplication by a uh, scalar. So let's say C is a complex number. So the action of A over C times a vector equals C times the action of A over, over B, over the vector. So these two properties um, are what we mean by linear. And unitary are, is necessary to preserve the probability. Because um, what unitary means is that, let's say uh, you have a, well, the, the state V and you compute the magnitude of that state and it's gonna be unchanged if you apply A. <clears throat> so the magnitude of the vector of the state V equals the magnitude of A of the vector that results from the application of A over, over V. So that's what we mean by unitary. Well, and this there's um well that's kind of an implication of unitary because we're gonna see a more general way of defining unitary operators or unitary matrices. Um, so now let's consider some examples. Um, we we defined above the inner product. So the inner product was this. And recall that this is just a, a merge of, well, this equals this, just a multiplication of, of two, two vectors. So um, if we take this A to this side, we have, or yeah, we have uh, this B and A. So here is uh, the other way, uh, first is E and then, first is A and then B. By the way, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, because this is a, a, new, a new product. It's not no longer the inner product, which is this way, but it's a cat times a bra. Um, so this is a, a different. In fact, this is going to give us a matrix instead of a, of a, of a number, of a scalar. Um, because, uh, well, uh, we can write again what A is. Uh, let's mm -hmm. write it here. Um, A is mm -hmm. A1 to AN. And B is this. So if we multiply these two vectors, we don't uh, get uh, a scalar, but we get a, a matrix, but in this in this slide, we're not going to compute uh, the matrix uh, representation of these operators because that's going to be the topic of, uh, I think, two slides uh, below this. Um, so let's define some operators, which we call the Pauli Pauli operators, which are three operators. These are Pauli operators. And there's another operator, which um, we call the identity. So the identity is defined as the outer product of the zero state uh, with itself, plus the outer product of the one, or let's say, let's say times, times one. Um, so yeah, that's what we define by identity. Um, and then the Pauli operators, the, the first one, the X on the operator or the X gate mm -hmm. is outer product of one and zero and zero and one, and we add them. Uh, the Y operator is kind of the same, but we have different scalars. 
we have i here and minus i here. And the z operator is um, 0, 0, minus 1, 1. So let's just keep it like this, uh, in this in this slide. And in the next, we're going to see what they look like in, um, yeah, in short. OK, so let's apply these operators to a qubit defined by this. So for example, let, let's apply the the identity to the state C. So the identity was defined as, as this, zero, zero, one, one. So we're going to apply it uh, on uh, the state Psi, which is alpha zero plus beta one. So uh, we can distribute it to get um, alpha zero. So here, alpha zero, zero. We're just making uh, this multiplication. And then this one, so we get beta zero, zero, one. Then plus alpha one, here, one, zero plus beta one, um, yeah, one, one. So um, recall that these two vectors are, well, they are the same. And this is just the dot product of, of zero with uh, itself. So this is gonna give us one because zero equals one zero and the magnitude of that equals one. So this is one, the dot product with itself is one. Um, these two are orthogonal because uh, one is zero one and those two vectors are orthogonal. So this is zero, the same here and here we have one. So we end up with alpha zero plus beta one. And this is the same state psi. So that's, that's why it's called the identity because it leaves the state unchanged. So you can uh, say that this, you can tell that this uh, operator is just the identity. It does nothing to, to the state. Now we can do the same with the X operator, for example. The X operator was defined as zero, one, plus one, zero. So we're gonna apply it on alpha zero plus beta one. Okay, so uh, let's do the same, the same thing. Have alpha zero, here one, zero, plus beta, zero, one, one, plus alpha one, zero, zero, plus beta one, zero, one. And this is uh, zero because they're orthogonal. This is one because they're unitary, uh, one and zero. <laughs> So what we get is beta, beta zero plus alpha one. Uh, so let me uh, rewrite it as, as this, alpha one plus beta zero. And consider the initial state, which was alpha zero plus beta one. So let's see what the X gate did to our state. So we had alpha zero and what happened then? Uh, we got, uh, we flipped the zero state. And the same happened with one state. It was one and then it was zero. So the, this X gate is flipping our, our states of the, our basis states. <clears throat> okay, so um, we can do the same with the Y operator and with the, the operator. 
but I, I think you can you can do it uh, right now because uh, these two examples. Now uh, let's see uh, what I promised uh, above to see just those operators as matrices. <laughs> So yeah, um, a matrix is um, is another way of organizing uh, numbers. We had the vectors, but we can arrange uh, numbers in other ways. So a matrix is a two-dimensional uh, array. And how are we going to to get matrices or two-dimensional arrays from from these two vectors? We have to make this this operation. And how do, do we do this? Well, uh, we have uh, this column vector A, A and this uh, row vector uh, B, which is conjugate, conjugated. So we're going to uh, write this vector A, N. And we're going to multiply the first component of the, the bra by all of those, by to all uh, the column, E1 conjugate. Yeah. So uh, we get to the end column, to A1 up to AN, and multiply it by the last component of the, the bra, EN conjugate. So that's the way we multiply um, these two these two vectors, um, which is the outer product. Uh, so let, let's uh, take some some examples to see this um, better. So let's take the the zero and one state. Um, so um, our what we want to do is to compute the Pauli operators as. Uh, the matrix rep representation of those operators. But first, we need to know what all of these outer products are. So this uh, this first uh, product, let me uh, use different colors. So well, this is one, zero, and uh, this is one, zero. This equals, um, well, we have a matrix. We have one, zero, one, zero. Then we multiply by one, one, which is the first component, and then by zero and zero, which is the second component. So this gives us um, one, zero, zero, zero. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, we can do the same with zero, it's this is zero, and this is one, this is the bra one. So we can do the same as above, with one zero times zero zero, which is the first component, and here one zero times one one, which is the second one. So uh, we get zero, one, zero, zero. And then we can do exactly the same thing on the other products. And in this one, we're going to get uh, this matrix. And this one, we're going to get this one matrix. So we see that these outer products are giving us each component of a two by two matrix. So if we have access to each component of a matrix, then we can build any matrix. So that's how we're going to uh, compute the Pauli matrices or just the Pauli operators as matrices. Um, I think we have space, yeah, we have space. Okay, so the identity matrix was, uh, Zero, zero, plus, well, I don't know. 
one one. Um, and this is one zero zero one plus one zero 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 one. So our result is just the identity matrix. That's why this operator is called the identity operator. We can do the same with X, uh, Y, and Z. X was zero one plus one zero. So this is um. Uh, let's see. This is um, zero, um, zero one zero plus zero one one. Oh, sorry. Zero zero. So this is uh, zero one one zero. That is the matrix representation of the of the x gate or the x body operator. Um, okay, uh, we can do it with i zero. One plus oh, sorry minus i one zero. So we're going to to get um this um this is i zero zero one zero minus i two one zero zero. So we get um zero minus i i zero. So this is the matrix representation of the y of the y gate, and finally we can do it with the z gate, which was uh, zero, zero, minus one, one, as an operator. So it uh, as a matrix, it looks like this. This is one zero 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 minus one zero 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 one. So we have one zero zero minus one. So these three are the Pauli matrices, which are just the uh, matrix representation of the Pauli operators. And plus we have the identity, um, the identity matrix, or the identity operator. And now we can apply, um, we can make the same example as we did uh, in, in the operators section. Um, but in this case, we can do it with matrices. So we have a state um, of this form, alpha zero plus beta one. And we saw that this is equivalent to this uh, representation. And we apply the X gate to that state. We completed this. So we can write the x matrix, which was uh, this one, to the alpha beta state. So um, the way uh, we multiply it, um, a matrix by a vector is that we write <clears throat> we write the the component of the of the vector. So this is the first component times the first column of the matrix zero one. And then the second component of the vector times the second um, column of the matrix. So this is beta alpha. So this is exactly the same we saw in the in the other case in which we had um, the state alpha beta and the components were flipped. So we started with alpha in the first position and then alpha was in the second position. So that means that the components were flipped. So that's uh, what the X gate uh, does. That's the action of, of X. Okay, so, um, well, you, uh, you can the same with the Z gate or the Y gate. Um, let's take the Z to take a, another example. So this is one, zero, zero, minus one. This is uh, alpha, beta, and well, alpha times the first column, one, zero, plus beta, the second uh, column, zero, minus one. So we get uh, alpha minus beta. So if we write it in the 
in the way of Dirac's notation, you have alpha, well, because this is alpha, well, it's, um, I think I can write it directly as a uh, direct notation. So this is alpha zero minus beta one. So um, you see that the constant didn't uh, change up to a sign. So this sign is called a phase. <clears throat> There's a more uh, general way of writing phases, but in this case, that sign is a phase. <clears throat> and phases are gonna be really important concepts we're gonna treat them um, in future lectures. So, well, take that um, into, into account. We're gonna work with them. Now, um, we have worked with um, single qubits and how we transform single qubits. Now, um, what happens if we have more than one qubit? In fact, if we have multi-qubit operators. So uh, one important gate is the C naught K. It always acts on two qubits. It has a control qubit and a target qubit. So um, we have two qubits. It acts on, this is the first part, it acts on two qubits. So let's say um, the first uh, qubit is psi and the second qubit is uh, phi. So we have to choose. We have to choose one of them to be the target qubit and the other one to be the control qubit. So let's say uh, this one is the control qubit. And this one is the target qubit. So um, how this gate C naught is going to act, well, C naught means controlled naught. Um, so if the control set is set to one, that means, if this uh, state, if uh, this is state um, psi equals state one, then um, the, the state, the target uh, qubit is going to be flipped. That means the X gate, which is the one that flips states is going to be applied on the target qubit. So if this is satisfied, then uh, phi goes to x phi. And if the other case is that if uh, psi equals uh, the zero, then nothing happens to, to phi. Well, then uh, it goes to the identity times uh, phi. So that's how the C naught acts. So you see that uh, the first qubit, the control qubit is unchanged but the state of the control qubit modifies the state of the target qubit. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's see the outer product representation of, of the C0 gate to see what the matrix look like. Um, <clears throat> so this is um, the outer product representation. We have this get zero, zero. Um, I didn't uh, show you what these uh, states are, um, let's write it here. So, well, I, I told you that those were um, vectors of dimension four. So we're just going to start putting them in, in the order. So this one, this was the first state. This is the second one, which is represented as follows. Yeah, like this. Um, one zero is zero, zero, one, zero. And one, one is the fourth state, which is this. So um, you can make those uh, outer products. And yeah, with, with these um, four, um, with these vectors of dimension four, and what you're going to get, well, this is the C naught operator. And the C not uh, associated matrix is going to be the following. One, zero, zero, one, zero here. And here we have this. <clears throat> so this is like, um, we have here the identity. 
and here we have the xk. So that's just the matrix representation. And well, also, we can make um, sort of a, of a truth table um, to define what the C0 gate uh, does. So um, the, the first state, which is the control qubit is unchanged. So it remains the same, but the state of X modifies the state of the second qubit. So Y goes to the addition modulo two of those two vectors. Because, well, that's uh, the condition. If X equals zero, then um, Y goes to, oh yeah, to, zero plus y, which is just y. And if x equals one, then y goes to one times this, uh, plus plus y, which is just the, the negation of, of y. So that's uh, just uh, saying the same, that the x gate is going to be applied, or the c naught is going to perform the addition modulo two of, of, the, of those quantities. In the, in the qubits. So now um, I told you that uh, there's an, like a definition for unitary operators or unitary matrices. And this is the slide. So uh, in quantum computing, all operators need to be unitary matrices because the transformations have to preserve the probability interpretation. And the probability interpretation, so let's, uh, let's make it like a, uh, like a sequence unitary. So uh, probabilities, uh, probability interpretation is preserved. And if um, probabilities uh, interpretations are preserved, then the, um, the norm or the magnitude of the, of the state is unchanged. So um, this is like um, the, sa the same thing. That's why we need uh, unitary. And the definition of unitary matrices is the following. So we need uh, to compute the Hermitian um, conjugate. Uh, Hermitian conjugate, and let me write that word. Hermitian conjugate is just the conjugate uh, transpose, or it's also called the adjoint. But well, let's say uh, the conjugate transpose matrix. So if we have uh, a matrix U, uh, whose components are this way, uh, U on N, oh. uh, this is, um, sorry, this was uh, N1. N This is one, yeah. Okay, so um, the, uh, the conjugate uh, transpose, we're going to turn um, columns into rows. It's, it's actually the same with vectors. Uh, remember that if we have uh, some vector of this type, uh, it turn into P1 like this, UN. So it's actually the same, we have here, uh, let me change uh, the color, this. So this is going to uh, become uh, a row. So you want one, you and one, and you, you want n. So uh, see that? This uh, column became a row. So it's doing the same. It's applying the operation. Um, for example, see that UN uh, went to U1N. So in general, if we have uh, two components, oh, uh, something something's missing, the conjugates, sorry, because it's the conjugate transpose. We only uh, transpose the matrix, but we also need to conjugate it. Uh, okay, so if we have two components, uh, I, A, 
um, goes to this. So that's uh, the trans uh, transposing uh, a matrix is applying that operation every component. And also, if we have the dagger uh, simple here, we need to conjugate the components. So uh, let's take, for example, the Y matrix to see if it's unitary or not. So this is um, zero minus I, I zero. So if we compute the uh, conjugate um, transpose, uh, we have the following. Um, the diagonal is unchanged because well, because of this operation, the diagonal, nothing happens to the diagonal, but the non-diagonal terms have to be uh, like flipped, have to be uh, switched. Um, okay, so we have here minus i and i. And now we're going to multiply y times y dagger. And this is zero minus i, i zero, zero i, minus i zero. And that uh, multiplication is going to be um, like this. We have to multiply um, columns by, by rows, <coughs> or rows by, <coughs> the, by columns. So we have here this and this. I'm going to multiply them <coughs> and get the first component. So the first component is going to be um, this uh, multiplication, which is going to give us zero times a zero plus minus i times minus i. <coughs> um, the second one is going to. Oh, sorry. Uh, something something was wrong because um, I only transposed the components. Okay, let's let me let me fix that because I, I made a, a mistake. Uh, so I'm going to uh, fix, uh, this because um, here I only transposed the matrix, but we also need to conjugate. Uh, I'm forgetting that the conjugates. So this is in fact, um, if I write it, okay. Yeah. So um, this is not the uh, conjugate transpose, but this is only the transpose. So this is only a, a T, but if we uh, have the conjugate transpose, we must conjugate the components of this matrix, which is zero minus one. Here we have I zero. Um, yeah, that's it. So I, I was I was forgetting the the conjugates, which are really important because I was not getting the identity matrix here, which is what uh, I would ex expect to happen. So um, this was plus i, and this was minus i. So we're just getting uh, y squared, and this is uh, yeah, now we can do it. Zero times zero minus i times i. And the second component is going to be this one multiplied by the second one, which is uh, i times zero plus zero times i. Um, the next component is the next column multiplied by the first row, which is uh, zero times uh, minus i minus i times uh, zero. And then finally, we have um, i times minus i, which is uh, the product of uh, this column is the last row. So, uh, well, plus zero times zero, and this is one, zero, zero, one. So in fact, um, this is, um, <clears throat> This is an unitary operator. So the Y matrix, the Y gate preserves probability because it's unitary because Y times its conjugate transpose, please don't forget the conjugates uh, that I forgot uh, twice in this, in this slide. This equals 
the identity. So it's unitary. And it's actually the same uh, to compute uh, this. This is also going to give the identity. Because, well, um, this is just uh, y squared. And um, as an exercise, you can do the same with the x gate and with the z gate. Okay, now let's talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. <clears throat> so, um, fine. Um, the eigenvectors of a matrix are defined as vectors that remain unchanged up to a constant factor. So let's let's draw a, a vector. This is let's say U. And let's say this matrix is A. And um, if we see what the action of A over the vector U would look like in the, in the drawing, it will be something like this. It's gonna be A, U. And if this happens, then we say that U is an eigenvector. That means um, if u is an eigenvector of a, when a is applied on, on, on u, then the direction of the vector does not change. It's only resized, but the dire direction remains the same. So that's uh, like a geometrical interpretation of what an eigen, an, yeah, an eigenvector is. So here it says that it remains unchanged up to a constant factor. So what is that constant factor? We call it lambda. So lambda times u. So here we see that if a acts, well, uh, this equation is uh, below, but let's let's look at this part. So um, if a acts on on u, then the direction is not changed because it's it's still u but a constant factor is uh, here. So uh, we can write the same equation using uh, Dirac's notation. So in this case, UA is an operator which has a matrix representation. So if that operator acts on, on the, yeah, well, on the eigenvectors or eigenstates, um, it remains unchanged up to a constant factor. So uh, that's the definition of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. In this equation, lambda is called the eigenvalue, which is the constant factor. And um, this uh, state u lambda is the eigenvector because it does not change direction. It only changes the size. Okay, so yeah, the geometrical interpretation is there, but how do we compute those quantities? If we have this equation, how do we find the, the eigenvalues, for example, or the eigenvectors? So for that, we need the characteristic equation. <clears throat> so we need a function of lambda, something like this. So the, the roots or the solution of, of, yeah, of that function are gonna give us the eigenvalues. Okay, so let's find that, that equation. We can start from this, from the definition, lambda u lambda. And then we can uh, rewrite it like this, minus lambda u lambda. And this is just, um, well, let me write an additional term, minus lambda identity times u lambda. Because, well, the identity um, leaves the uh, state the same and changes. So uh, we can factorize, we can take uh, u lambda state as a common, common factor. So this is going to give us the following equation. Uh, okay, so 
um, and this equals uh, zero. Okay, so uh, we arrived to, to this equation. And there's a, a theorem in, in linear algebra that tells us that this system is solvable, has a unique solution if the determinant of a minus lambda i equals zero. So this is in fact the function f that we were looking for. And our characteristic equation is, uh, well, it's this one, but well, it's the same. Our function is the determinant of the operator minus lambda uh, times the identity. Okay, so that is the characteristic equation. We can make some, some examples using the Pauli matrices we saw before. Um, but first, I, I want to, to give you like a like a trick to compute um, determinants or well characteristic equations uh, in two by two matrices. So let's take an arbitrary matrix A, which is this A, B, um, C, D. So the determinant of A equals uh, oh, sorry equals AD minus BC, just uh, multiply in this way and subtract. And there's also um, another uh, quantity that we can compute for matrices, which is called a trace. Uh, just the trace. Trace of A is going to be the, the addition of the diagonal terms. Okay. So now let's compute the determinant, the characteristic equation, which is the determinant of A minus lambda identity. So just the determinant of the following matrix. We have A matrix A, which is this one, minus uh, lambda times the identity, which is this matrix. So we have the determinant of a minus lambda, B, C minus, oh, sorry. C, D minus lambda, and this equals zero. So this is the characteristic equation. So um, we can compute this determinant because this is a two by two matrix. So it's, uh, it's easy to compute. A minus lambda times D minus lambda minus BC equals zero. So this is our characteristic equation for um, any two by two matrix. Um, we can expand those uh, terms, uh, minus A lambda minus B lambda plus lambda squared minus BC, this equals zero. And this is, this is uh, the trick. So this is AD minus BC minus a plus d lambda plus lambda squared equals zero. And um, the first term is just the determinant of a. And the second one is the trace of a. So the characteristic equation is lambda squared minus or, uh, the trace of a times lambda. Um, plus the determinant A equals zero. So this is our characteristic equation for a two by two matrix. And we're gonna use this result to compute um, the eigen uh, values of the, let's take the, the X gate. Okay, so for the X gate, um, we have that the trace, well, let, let's write the X gate uh, as a matrix. It was zero, one, one, zero. So the trace of X equals zero, which is the addition of the diagonal terms. And the determinant of X equals minus one. So we can use uh, this, this general characteristic equation to compute the eigenvalues of the X gate, the X matrix. So we have lambda squared, 
plus the trace, but the trace of x is zero, so we don't write uh, this term. Um, plus the determinant, which is minus one, is equal to zero. Therefore, um, the eigenvalues um, uh, plus minus one. Those are the eigenvalues of the of the x uh, matrix, of the x power uh, matrix. And now, um, well, we found the eigenvalues, but what about the eigenvectors? So uh, to compute the eigenvectors, we need uh, the following. We need to use the definition of eigenvectors. So uh, it was we have uh, two eigenvalues, so we have two uh, eigenvector equations. The first one is u with eigenvalue one. So this is going to give us uh, the eigenvalue times the vector, but the eigenvalue is one. So just like this. And the second equation is x times u minus one because the second eigenvalue is minus one. So here on the right side, we have uh, the eigenvalue times the vector. The eigenvalue is minus one times u minus one. So uh, we need to solve those systems. So uh, let's say um, let's say u one equals um, well, this is a vector. Um, this is u one, but this is the the first component. Let's write it uh, like this: the first component and u one, but the second component. And we can multiply zero one one zero times this one first component, one second component. So our um what what I'm I'm trying to do is to find uh, these components of the eigenvector, because uh, if we find the components, we, we have the eigenvector. So um, we have to solve this equation. The first component of u1, second component of u1. So to make uh, this multiplication, we have already uh, done multiplication. So in fact, um, the x gate is just gonna flip the, the components. So this is gonna be, U1 second component, uh, U1 the first component. So this equation must hold for an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. Um, and from here we can uh, conclude that those two components must be uh, the same. So um, we can write our eigenvector as some constant c times one one because well the two components are equal so we say c and c but re recall that we need a state vector to be normalized so um, what is the normalization factor well we have to divide divide by uh, by the by the magnitude of the vector so we get the following one over the square root of two one one and we can do exactly the same with the second equation uh, we'll see that uh, the eigenvector with eigenvalue equals minus one equals one over the square root of two one minus one so uh, these are the two eigenvectors of the x of the x uh, matrix, and uh, yeah, we have we have done it. Uh, now to to finish um, on eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we'll see um, the spectral decomposition of an operator. So um. We have been working with X, so uh, let's just work with X because, because we have completed like everything for it. Um, so what the expect spectral decomposition uh, tells us is that an operator can be written in terms of its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So um, it's in this way. So let's say we have um, 
no, well, this is these are the eigenvalues and these are the eigenvectors, but this is an outer product. So this is going to give us, for example, the first eigenvalue times the outer product of, of the um, corresponding eigenvectors. And we can add up to, or to the last, let's say, let's say we have n and eigenvalues to n eigenvectors. And that's it. So uh, we can make an example for the for the x escape because we already computed the, uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the x x gate. So x um well x equals zero one one zero. Um the eigenvalues are one one equals one over the square root of two one one and the second eigenvalue minus one so u minus one equals oops one over the square root of two one minus one okay so let's apply the right side of this equation um so we have one times u one u one minus um u minus one u minus one so um this is uh, actually um well this is uh, one over the square root of two one one times one over the square root of two one one minus one over the square root of two one minus one here one minus one so um, this is one half of one 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 because they're all they're all one so one times one so always going to give you one minus one half of something written here one over the square root of two um so well this is um one um. Oh, one minus one times one 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 minus one times minus one minus one. So this is giving us one 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 minus one half of one minus one minus one one. So uh, we can check that uh, the diagonal terms are gonna cancel because we have one minus one so zero, zero. and the non-diagonal terms are going to be uh, one because well they're going to be just uh, one half plus one half so we get the x gate that is the spectral decomposition that can be can be done with the rest operators uh, y and uh, z um you can can do it okay so uh, that's all with um with this um, linear algebra, I, I don't see any question in the pasting uh, channel, so I'm going to just continue. Okay, so uh, let's get into uh, the classical computing. Um, in classical uh, computing, we also use gates, but those gates uh, are applied on bits, not just the classical bits. Uh, the classical bit takes, um, well, it's, it's built to, take uh, two values, uh, zero and one, as well as in quantum computing. But the difference is that the superposition in classical computing, you do not have that linear combination that is also an allowed state. So, well, uh, we have also gates. So for example, uh, the not gate, which is represented as this, it takes an input A, uh, well, and and uh, return some output B. So we can build uh, truth tables with those for those gates. So uh, A takes two possible uh, values, which are zero and one. Those are equivalent in logic to like uh, true or false or uh, well something or high or low, or true, false, uh, high low or just uh, one 
uh, zero. Well, yeah, you can you can give the interpretation you want. We're going to be working with zeros and one. So if we have the not gate, we're going to invert the input. So if we have a zero, uh, our output is going to be one, and the same with uh, zero, with one and zero. So it's just like applying the x the x gate. This is just uh, inverting. Uh, we have uh, two bits um, gates, for example, the AND gate, A, B. We have two inputs, and it's represented like this, and some output C. So let's take the uh, possible combinations. If we have uh, two inputs, then we have four possible uh, combination of, of the total input. Uh, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So um, the AND uh, gate is going to be one only if the two inputs are, are one, so like, like that. And the rest is going to be zero. So um, those, oper those uh, gates come from the logical operators well that we treat with true and false it's actually the same but applied on in computation um okay uh, so we have another gate which is the or gate and it gives a one if at least one of the inputs equals one so let's make the truth table so again the possible combinations <clears throat> and, um, oh, yeah. um, okay, so if at least one of the inputs is one, the output is going to be one. So in this case, we have a one, 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 and the last case, uh, zero. So this is the OR operator, or the OR gate, in this case. We have um, some other um, classical uh, gates. Uh, for example, the NAND, which is the negation of the of the AND gate, we have again two inputs, and we we draw it like this, like an AND gate, but with this circle here. So um, we can build again the truth table if it's the negation of the of the AND gate. And the AND gate is one only if the two inputs are one. So here we will have a, a one, but if we invert it, we have a zero, then a one, one, one. <clears throat> and that's how, how the NAND gate works. Um, the XOR or the exclusive OR. So um, let's build the truth table. Uh, see again. So uh, in this case, it's like an OR, but it excludes when the two inputs are one. So zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. So we have uh, when it's one, if at most um, one input is, is one. So we have one, one, the rest is. Uh, uh, zero. Fine. So these are some some gates that are used in classical computing. So uh, we can build some circuits uh, out from out of um, gates. So one of them is the half other. Oh, um, uh, first uh, I'm going to give some interpretation for the XOR gate and the AND. Um, so um, check that C equals A plus uh, B, the addition modulo two, because, well, uh, zero plus uh, zero equals zero, zero plus one equals one, one plus zero equals one, and one by one, uh, we, we reach the, the basis, which um, is two, so uh, we have a, a zero uh, modulo, modulo two. And the end is giving us the, 
multiplication of the inputs. Because, well, zero times zero, zero, zero times one is zero, one times zero is zero, one times one is one. So um, let's take that into account for the circuits. The circuit is called um, the half other. So um, it's a part of the, of the, of the addition, the addition um, algorithm, the addition operation. So we have these two inputs or two numbers and we want to add them. So this is a part of the, of the circuit that uh, makes the addition. So this is an X or gate, and this is an AND gate. Um, so um, this S, the first output is going to give you A plus B, the addition modulo uh, two. And C is called the carrier. So this is uh, kind of uh, the sum and C gives you the multiplication of the carrier. So uh, if you want to multiply uh, two numbers, so, sorry, if you want to add two numbers, like make A plus B, first uh, you perform the addition modulo uh, two of those, of those numbers. So um, if those numbers are both one, then this is of course going to give you um, um, a zero. So, so you need a new you need a new bit um, to represent that number. So that's why uh, the carrier uh, needs to be needs to be taken. So uh, you take a branch for each bit and apply it an AND gate. So you have the carrier. So um, the truth table for well, uh, the truth table can, can be built, but it's just gonna be an XOR gate and an AND gate uh, that gives you well the sum addition module two and what you carry if you reach the, the basis, if you reach two. Okay. And finally, uh, well, uh, it's not the last slide. So um, there are some gates that are universal. There's a concept uh, called the universality. So as an example, let's work with the NAND gate. So in classical computing, you can build any gate out of NAND gates. Therefore, any computation can be done with only NAND gates. So um, in the previous slide, we saw a simple circuit that performs the addition. So the addition is one of the uh, basic operations that you need uh, for a computer to, to do, a computer must be able to, to make sums, to make operations. So that's why these gates and circuits are so important because well, they're just like the way that a computer works, the operations that a computer can, uh, can make. So um, if you have a gate that can um, reproduce any uh, gate, then it's universal. So that's uh, the case of NAND. Uh, we call that NAND is the negation of, of the AND gate. So um, I'm just uh, going to show you the simple example here to build the, the node out of, of the NAND gate. Uh, so let's write again the truth uh, table of the NAND gate. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. This is uh, 1, 1, 1, 0. So um, let's say if we have the following um, configuration, the following uh, setup of, of the gate. So we have an input A and an output B. But um, there's a, here's a, uh, here we take a copy of, of the bit. So the two inputs are equal. So, well, A could be uh, either zero or, or one. So if it's a zero, then the two inputs of the gate are zero. So we are here and the output is one. And if A equals uh, one, A is one, then we are here. So uh, our output is going to be zero. So um, you see that, this configuration of the NAND gate is equivalent to 
unknown. And uh, you can do the same for the end because, well, it's um, it's easier because uh, the NAND gate is just uh, negation of the end. So if you want to recover the AND gate, you have to invert. So this is just an AND gate. And you can do uh, the same for the OR gate. For the OR gate, you will need uh, three, three NAND gates, uh, three NAND gates. Um, but well, I, I'm just going to leave it uh, here. But uh, an OR gate can be also um, done out, out of uh, NAND gates. And well, uh, this part is just to mention, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of this because uh, it will be topic of next lectures and you'll be working with them. So this is just uh, to mention that there, there are also quantum, uh, universal quantum gates, as well as in classical uh, computing. Um, so you can build um, any, any transformation of, from some particular set of gates. So there, that's an universal uh, set of quantum gates. And those gates are the rotation gates. This, uh, as I told you, um, you're gonna see those later, so uh, don't worry. This is just uh, mentioning them. Uh, a phase shift uh, gate and a C node gate. We already saw the C node gate, so yeah, um, that'll be it. And that's that's all. Uh, I didn't see any any questions, so I guess it's okay. And uh, and all the doubts were answered in the chat. So thank you so much for listening and good luck in the next lecture.